Thank you, Olivia. That's beautiful. Be still, my soul. The Lord is on thy side. That's the text to that hymn that was right in the middle of that beautiful prelude that she played. We're here to worship an audience of one, and that one is Jesus Christ himself, wherever you are today, that you are worshiping him and him alone. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. I hope that you have clean hands today, but I hope that you have a pure heart. Let's worship together.
Good morning. Welcome to this online worship service from First Baptist Church of Alexandria. You look pretty casual out there in your pajamas and bathrobes or that second cup of coffee, but that's all right. This is going to be the way it's going to be for a while. We know next week will be the same schedule, and I regret that. I, I say a lot of times that uh, online worship is good, but it's no substitute for being there. And I still think that, but I'm glad we can do it this way today. Your pastors are having constant discussions about what's going to happen next, and we will present to you a plan very soon because we don't want to stay away from each other. We want to connect with each other, so stay tuned for that. The church is not shutting down. You can't go to church, but you're still the church, and so look for ways in these chaotic days that you can make a difference for the kingdom. Stay in touch with one another every way you possibly can and look out for the vulnerable, those in greatest need, and be a blessing to them. A couple of weeks ago, the big question was, what are you going to give up for Lent? Well, that's been answered for us. We're going to be giving up a lot of things, but we're not giving up our faith and we're not giving in to fear. Our trust is in God, and he's going to see us through all of this. I have a lovely Jewish friend, and she texted me a verse of Scripture. You know, the Bible always has the answer for us. This is Exodus chapter 30, verse 21. They shall wash their hands and not die. So that's going to be the rule. Keep your hands clean. Your stewardship is absolutely essential. Churches everywhere are going to be struggling these next few days and will be among them unless you are faithful in your giving. So I want to encourage you to give online or mail in your offering so that we can continue to do the vital things, the important work that we do. It's essential. Now, we're just beginning this service, and you know that churches all over the East Coast are doing the very same thing we're doing, and so your internet connection may fail at some point. If it does, try again later. And if you can't get on, we are recording this and you can watch it maybe later today or tomorrow. So you won't be missing a thing. The president has declared a national state of emergency. He's also declared this day to be a day of prayer. So I want us to cooperate with that. We certainly are people of prayer at First Baptist. So pray with me now. Dear God in heaven, we know that nothing takes you by surprise and that, Lord, if you've led us to this moment, you'll lead us through it and your presence will be with us always. We pray for those in leadership as they make important decisions, for scientists who are working now around the clock to find a cure, for healthcare professionals who are on the front lines putting their lives in danger for us, for those who take care of people sick at home, we ask a blessing for them. And Lord, for everybody who's a victim of this virus, we pray they'll come through it well and happy and everything back in order soon. May we not give in to fear or panic, but to trust in you always. Our confidence is in the true and living God, and we make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Heavenly Father is great. And when we praise him in saying that he is great, he loves that. Let's worship him together. And days to end. 
Yes, you are at home, but a faithful group of folks, these singers and musicians, came in to help us with this service today. Some of our folks are on staff, but most of these are volunteers, and they're giving of their time. Not to mention the great technical crew behind all of this that's making it possible for us to communicate with you today. I'm going to continue my series of talks on time. It's about time. Last week, Reed talked about redeeming the time. I started the series the week before. Today, my subject is somewhere in time, somewhere in time. And I'm excited to share this with you. One of the things I'm most interested in, just as kind of a side interest of mine, is time travel. It's always been intriguing to me. I don't know if you think much about it. But this uh, idea started in 1895 when H.G. Wells wrote his classic book, The Time Machine. And in that story, a man goes hundreds and hundreds of years into the future and comes back and talks about it. You may remember the movie in 1985, Back to the Future. And maybe you'll watch that during one of these days when you are stuck at home. But my favorite time travel movie is somewhere in time. And, and I love it because it has romance, it has time travel, it has Jane Se a younger Jane Seymour, and it has the fabulous Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island. I remember when we saw that movie in 1980, we were not so long married ourselves, we drove from Virginia up to Michigan, Mackinac Island, just to see that hotel and maybe stay there and capture some of the flavor of that great romance. When we got there, we found out it was much too expensive to stay, so we just had breakfast on the wide veranda and then went on our way got just a taste of that time travel emphasis. I don't know if you believe in it or not, but the fact is the Bible has a story about it in Scripture that indicates that maybe, just maybe, it is possible. Take your Bibles and turn to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 20. This story is actually told twice in the Bible. It's told in 2 Kings 20. It's also recorded in Isaiah chapter 38. But we're looking at 2 Kings chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order, because you're going to die. You will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and he prayed to the Lord. Remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Before Isaiah had left the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him. Go back and tell Hezekiah, the ruler of my people, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David says. I've heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the temple of the Lord, and I will add 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. Then Isaiah said, Prepare a poultice of figs. They did so and applied it to the boil, and Hezekiah recovered. Hezekiah had asked Isaiah, what will be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I will go up to the temple of the Lord on the third day from now? Isaiah answered, this is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he has promised. Shall the shadow go forward 10 steps or shall it go back 10 steps? It's a simple matter for the shadow to go forward 10 steps, said Hezekiah. Rather, have it go back 10 steps. Then the prophet Isaiah called on the Lord, and the Lord made the shadow go back the 10 steps it had gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. Hezekiah is 39 years of age. His kingdom is in trouble. Invasion is threatening. He's having a midlife crisis of sorts. And then the prophet Isaiah tells him, the diagnosis is in. You're not going to recover from this. You're going to die. Set your house in order. Hezekiah, like you would, was shaken 
He turned his face toward the wall, maybe the wall in his room, or maybe this is a reference to the wall in Jerusalem. But he turns his face toward the wall. He's weeping, and he's crying out to God. God, remember me. Remember my faithfulness. Remember how I've served you. And please, restore my health. Well, Isaiah had left the room. Isaiah had gone down the steps and was halfway across the courtyard when he gets an urgent message from God. Isaiah, go back. I've heard his prayer, and I'm going to heal him. I'm going to give him 15 more years. And just as Isaiah had gone down the steps from the bedroom, now he goes back up the steps with the word, you are going to survive. Now, does God answer prayer? When you're in need, when you have a diagnosis, when there are problems in your life, does God hear you when you pray? This story reminds me that he does. All things are possible with God. So Hezekiah receives this message. But then, uh, I don't know that I would have done this, but Hezekiah says, how do I know for sure? Give me a sign that this is going to be. And so Isaiah gives him a choice. Which would you prefer? For the shadow to go forward 10 steps or backwards? Imagine a sundial. That's what it's talking about. He's on his bed. He's looking out to the, the bedroom door and he's looking at the steps going down. Now the shadow is going to go down normally and that's what Hezekiah says. It's no big deal for that to happen. That will happen in the course of time. But if it could go backwards, then, then I would know. And the scripture says that's exactly what happened. I can't explain it. Very few commentators even try to explain this. But it's in the Bible, so that's enough for me. The point that's being made in this story, I think, is that God is sovereign over time. Psalm 90, verse 1 that it says that before the mountains were formed, before the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God is timeless. You and I are bound by time. 70, 80 years is about all we get. But God has no beginning and no end. And so he is in charge of time. And nothing takes him by surprise. This crisis we're in right now did not take God by surprise. He is sovereign over time. Now, I asked you if you believe in time travel, and you probably don't, I'll, I'll admit that, but I think maybe you do more than you know. I think all of us do, because all of us spend a lot of our time in another time zone than the one we're living in. We're either stuck in the past, burdened by it, chained to it, or we are off in the future somewhere worried about what might happen. We're not living in the moment that God has put us in. So that's what I want to talk about for just a few moments today, and I hope you can stick with me for just a few moments. The first thing I want you to see is that we can't change the past. The reason you don't want to live in the past is you can't change it. Now, in that original Time Machine book, 1895, H.G. Wells, it was all set far into the future. So far, I can't relate to it. So I'm not interested in stories about going into the future. I'm interested in stories about going to the past. I want to see Marty McFly save Doc from the terrorists. I want him to keep his parents in love so that he can be produced. I'm, I'm interested in going backwards. I'm interested in the possibility of going back to Ford's Theater in April of 1865 and maybe standing in the doorway before Booth got in there would it have made a difference or even to be at Logan International Airport in Boston on 9-11 as people were boarding the plane that brought destruction ah to go back and change the past but you can't that's my point you cannot change the past maybe you've got a skeleton or two in yours. I guess we all do, don't we? And maybe that skeleton has already fallen out of the closet and everybody knows your story. Or you live in constant dread that one day the truth will come out and people will know. You're carrying a heavy load from the past. Maybe relationships that have frayed 
and there are people you don't talk to anymore. It happened in the past. You can't even remember all the details of what happened, but you're lugging it around with you still. Here's my suggestion to you. You can't change it, but you can go back and look at it. It might be that you're not remembering exactly what happened the way it really happened. Maybe you're carrying a guilty conscience over something that happened to you as a child and somebody made you think you were responsible, but you were the innocent victim. Maybe it wasn't your fault at all. And now as an adult, you can look back and evaluate and, and see if that's true. We're in an election season and uh, if you're as old as I am, you remember 1972, that's when Richard Nixon won a landslide he ran against Senator George McGovern. George McGovern. He, his, his platform was anti-Vietnam War, and uh, he, he uh, lost badly. It was the worst electoral defeat probably in United States history, George McGovern. He was known as a peacenik. But what a lot of folks don't know or don't remember is that during World War II, the 1940s, he was something of a a hero, as so many were. He was a, a bomber pilot for the United States. One day, he's coming back late in the war. This was uh, April or May of, 18, of 1945. He was coming back from a bombing raid over Germany. He was coming back to his base in Italy and was flying over Austria. And uh, one of his crew came to him and said, Captain, the bomb, the last bomb, didn't release. It's, it's trapped underneath the plane. We can't land with that bomb there. You're going to have to drop it. And they were running low on fuel. He's flying over Austria. So he, makes, he gives the order to drop that bomb. And as he looks out his window, he sees they're passing over an Austrian farm village. Barn, house, animals. He sees the bomb go down. And he knows he's just killed an innocent Austrian farm family. When he lands in Italy, they rush to his plane and they hand him a telegram. From home, his wife had just given birth to their firstborn child. But he couldn't celebrate because he knew he had just killed an innocent family. McGovern said, that bothered me for the next 40 years. So while he was running for president against the Vietnam War, that was probably in his mind, the innocent people who lose their lives in war. It bothered him for 40 years. In 1985, he's invited to Innsbruck, Austria, the University of Innsbruck, to give a series of lectures. And in the course of those lectures, he tells that story. And he apologizes for what he did to contribute to that. When he walked off the stage, somebody handed him a telephone. It, it had been broadcast live. They handed him a telephone. And on the other end of the line was an aged Austrian farmer. Sir, I heard your story. That was my house. That was my family. We saw you coming. We were glad you were bombing Hitler. We all ran for cover. We were all safe. You didn't kill anybody that day. He'd been carrying the burden all those years. What are you carrying that isn't even true? But maybe it is true because we are sinners. We do things that are wrong. We do hurt innocent people. When we sin, we got to deal with that too. We can't change it. We have to do what God says to do. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 Verse 8, if we claim to be without sin, and you wouldn't do that. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and he will forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's what you do with your sin. You take it to God. You don't excuse it. You don't make excuses. You name it and you forsake it. It's not just admitting that you've done something wrong. It's admitting it, agreeing with God about it, and getting up and going in a new direction. 
And Jesus makes that possible because he went to the cross to pay for all of our sins, to provide a way of salvation so that if we believe in him, trust in him, we can have everlasting life. Somebody has called this particular verse, 1 John chapter 1, 8 and 9, God's bar of soap. When we as Christians sin, this is what we do with it. This is how we get the virus off of our hands and off of our hearts. You can't live in the past. You can't change it. Second thing, just as true, we cannot, must not fear the future. We're not there yet. Let's not fear the future. What are you afraid of, most afraid of? Well, that's easy today, but you had other fears before this week. The stock market and retirement, failure on the job, nuclear disaster, and now along comes coronavirus. And there's so much information and false information, and paranoia grows, and we don't know what to do. We're afraid. Let me remind you that most of the things we're afraid of never really happened. Mark Twain said, I have had many worries in my life, most of which never happened. And think about it this way. If you're worried about something, and Jesus said, don't be anxious, don't worry. Worry can't change a thing. If you worry through something and then it doesn't happen, you've uh, you've w w worried needlessly. And if it does happen, then you've had to endure it twice. All your hours of worry and then the actual experience itself. Worry can't change a thing. And Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, when we give in to worry, we're just like the pagans. I don't want to be like the pagans. I want to demonstrate faith in God. In God we trust is more than just a slogan on our coins. It is Bible and it's true for you and for me. Now, the biggest fear, I suppose, that everybody has at some place in their being is the fear of death, the last enemy. And the fact is, that's what people are thinking about with coronavirus. Is this going to be your elderly? Is this going to be it for, for you? And, uh, and we certainly hope not. We don't think it will be. We think most people will recover. But the fear of death. The Bible says that Jesus is victor over death. I am the resurrection and the life. He defeated death. And as we believe in him, we shall too. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Thanks be to God. He's given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In Philippians 1, he said, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far, far better. We don't need to be afraid of death. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the imaginations of man, the things God has prepared for those that love him. You don't need to be afraid of death. He's conquered it. And as you put your faith in Christ, he has prepared for you and for me a place where we will be with him forever, where there's no sickness or sorrow, pain or death anymore. I love that hymn, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, when I tread the verge of Jordan, bid my anxious fears subside, bear me through the swelling current and lead me safe on to Canaan's side. When we close our eyes in this life, we open our eyes in the presence of God. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. These are things I share at funeral services, but I believe them as much as I believe anything I preach, any part of my Christianity, we don't need to be afraid of death. And actually, if you know this story, read on, God does give Hezekiah 15 more years, but they weren't that good. Later, he would probably think, I, I wish I'd just gone on and died when God first said I was going to. A son was born to Hezekiah who ended up being the most evil, wicked king Judah ever had. There's some things worse than death. You can't change the past. 
We should not fear the future. So what does God want? What, what are we supposed to do on this day? God expects us to live fully in the present, to be in this moment. Realize that at best, life is short. It's going to be short for all of us. Psalm 90 says 70 or 80 years. Some people live longer. Some people live a lot shorter. But at best, relatively speaking, in the, in the line of all eternity, life is short. Know what season it is in your life. Are you young and you've got the whole world ahead of you? Don't worry about the stock market. It will come back for you. It's us older folks that are worried about it. No. Know what season it is in your life. Are you going for success? That's what younger people do. Building a career, going for success. After you cross a certain point in your life, you realize success isn't all it's cracked up to be. And now you emphasize, you go for significance. You want your life to count for somebody else. You want to make a difference. You want to leave the world whenever you do a better place than it was when you arrived. One person said, I've spent my whole life climbing the ladder only to realize I've had it leaning against the wrong tree. Where are you leaning your ladder that you're climbing? Make the most of this moment by establishing a meaningful relationship with God. You know, that's something you can do. You can veg out on Netflix for the next two, three weeks, whatever it ends up being, and, and I'll watch some myself, but... How much better to spend these days getting closer to God, reading his word, praying, thinking about eternal things. We ought to come out of this stronger as a people, as an individual, and as a church. Our church should be stronger when this is over than it is today. Establish a meaningful relationship with God that will last for eternity and that comes through faith in Christ. And enjoy the moment. Now, there are certain things you can't do right now, places you can't go right now, church, for example. But enjoy what you can. I'm looking forward to the cherry blossoms. They haven't canceled that. Cherry blossoms will still be out next week and the week after. I'm looking forward to seeing them, a reminder of God's goodness and God's grace. Connect with people by telephone, FaceTime, Skype, WhatsApp, Connect, stay in touch. Live this life fully in the moment. Work hard as you're able. Be grateful for what God has given you, the days that are yours. Get plenty of rest. They say that's essential for keeping our health. Plenty of rest. But live in this moment. You can't change the past. You can't really change the future all that much. But you can live today. John Singer Sargent was the great painter of the 19th century, early 20th century. John Singer Sargent. He, he wanted, his goal was to paint the definitive portrait of Theodore Roosevelt. And uh, in those days, you could, you could hang around the White House. This is like 1900 or so. You could hang around the White House and nobody bothered you much. So he hung around the White House waiting for a chance. And he would see him occasionally. And it wasn't the right time, but he, he hung in there. One day, John Singer Sargent was in the White House. And bounding down the steps was T.R., Theodore Roosevelt. And as he stopped at the bottom of the steps, there was Sargent. And Roosevelt said, what do you want? And he said, I want to paint you, sir. Roosevelt said, okay, right now, right now, yes, right now. So he set up his easel, began to paint, and that picture, well, it's, it hangs in galleries, it hangs in the White House, it's on the covers of books. Roosevelt standing at the bottom of a staircase with his hand on the newel post. He was teaching Sargent to seize the moment. So look for the moment God has arranged for you. It could be right now, this moment, where you can make a difference. Somewhere in time. That's where we are. Be sure you're in the right zone today. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word.
Thank you for these reminders, and I pray we can all put them to practice for your honor and glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to watch this video. Sometimes people ask why. Why do we do this? When we came up here, I didn't feel capable. Because I was scared. Why do we take our families away from places that are familiar and move to places that are far off? My wife was nine months pregnant and we did not know one person who lived in the city. Why do we come to where there's nothing so we can try and start something? The Lord really just, he broke my heart for this city before I stepped off the plane. Why do we stress and strain and struggle and sweat just to make life better for someone else? There's so many people that are broken, that are lost, and it's heartbreaking. Yes, sometimes people ask why, and when they do, we tell them. There's places where the truth hasn't yet reached. We need to share the gospel and reach out our community. We tell them there's a God who loves them so much, he sent us. God spoke to us, broke our hearts for the city, and God's call trumps all. And we tell them there are people who love them so much. They give so that we can go. When people give uh, to missions, things happen. New believers are getting baptized. New churches are started. So when people ask why, that's what we tell them. We tell them it's the gospel. It's all about the gospel. Tory time at First Baptist Church. We don't have plates or ushers. We don't have you, but it's still time to give. If you're already set up for online giving, that's great. If you've not done so, go to our website right now or you saw a number where you could text, uh, text your gift. Uh, it's going to be so encouraging to see your faithfulness and to know that we can proceed, we can go on with the things God is leading us to do, including missions. I want our missions pastor, Wayne Jenkins, to come. He's going to lead us in prayer. The good news is you have a plate in your pocket. Take out your phone now. Go on the app, and let's give together. Let's pray. Jesus said, my father is always working, and I, too, am working. Father, we are confident in your working now, even as we are dispersed. But we remember that this is not the first time your people have been dispersed. And so we pray that everywhere we are, we are your mission points and your missionaries, and that we are faithful to see the opportunities you give us and to do the work you have before us, even in different places and in new ways. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.
God bless you this day with clean hands and with a pure heart. Amen.